Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my adventure into assembly programming of the RP2040. Last time, I figured out how to run an assembly language program without using the SDK. That opens up a whole world of bare metal programming, but at a price. With no SDK, we have to do everything ourselves. That includes configuring every aspect of the RP2040 chip. However, that's a good thing because this forces me into learning about the low-level, gory details of how the RP2040 is configured. This time, I want to control the speed of the processor. So, why don't you join me as we dig into configuring and using the various clock options of the RP2040. The RP2040 was designed for use in a wide variety of applications. To provide a choice to developers between low-cost or highly stable operation, it was designed with a choice of four different clock sources. These include an on-chip ring oscillator for low-cost, low-power, and low-chip count operations, a crystal oscillator for highly stable operation, external clocks to allow the developer to utilize a clock that's already present in the application, and a phase lock loop to synthesize higher frequencies from stable clock sources such as a crystal oscillator. The ring oscillator is essentially a series of on-chip inverters whose outputs are tied to the inputs. This is an unstable configuration since the inverters are always trying to correct themselves. As a result, the signal goes into oscillation. The frequency can be varied using several on-chip options. Unfortunately, since the frequency is also subject to manufacturing variations, ambient temperature, and supply voltage, it cannot be relied on to supply the highly accurate clock source needed for time-critical applications. The ring oscillator is started automatically during the RP2040 power-up and provides the clock during boot-up. The microcontroller can run quite nicely on the ring oscillator if an accurate clock is not needed. Let's return to our blinking LED program from the previous video. As a refresher, I first take the I.O. bank out of reset and then assign a GPIO pin to one of the GP pads. Then we alternately turn on and turn off our selected GPIO pin while calling a delay routine in between state changes to slow the action down. For more detail on how the program works, please see Bare Metal Adventures Chapter 4. I'll put a link in the description below. Since we're going to compare clock frequencies among different options, I'm going to decrease the delay loop factor to F0000 hex. I'll also change the blinking output to GPIO4 so I can attach a scope to the output. Let's start demo 1 using the ring oscillator just as it comes out of reset. The oscillator should be running at about 6.5 MHz. I don't know for sure, but I'm measuring a blinking period of 1.16 seconds or a frequency of 0.86 Hz, which seems about right. However, we can speed up or slow down the clock if we want. We can vary the number of stages in the ring oscillator, the power of each stage, and use a divider to get close to the frequency we want. Higher clock frequencies give us faster performance, and lower clock frequencies reduce power consumption for battery-powered operations. The next demonstration, Demo 2, increases the speed of the clock. As always, I'll use the RP2040 datasheet as my guide. Let's first turn to section 2.17.3. Our ranges for the clocks have the descriptive name of low, medium, high, and too high. These refer to the number of stages in the ring oscillator. The more stages, the lower the frequency. Remember, this is not an accurate clock, we're just getting close to what we want. In this demonstration, I'll choose the high speed. This should give us a clock about two times faster than the base clock. In our program, first get the base address of the ring oscillator registers. We'll assign 4006000 to ROSC base. I'll load that address into register 0, and then I'll load AA hex into register 1. This is the prefix for the output divider register. I'll shift it over 4 bits to align it to the proper place, and then add a 1 to assign a divisor of 1. 
I'll store it in the output divider register at an offset of 10 hex. Now that we've loaded the output divider, we can select the ring oscillator speed. Here I've hard coded the 12 bit enable code and the base for the ring oscillator speed using 00FAB FA0 hex. I'll load it into register 1 and then add 7 to select high speed. Finally, I store it in the ring oscillator control register at an offset of 0. Let's try out the new clock speed. Here I measure a blink frequency of 22.76 Hz, significantly faster than the default clock speed coming out of the boot ROM. The default clock speed is derived by choosing low speed with an output divider of 16. For reference, here is a table of the blink period for low, medium, high, and too high using an output divider of 1. The ring oscillator frequency can also be modified by adjusting the drive strength of each stage. Going back to section 2.17.3, we see that there are two registers, Freak A and Freak B, that control the strength of each of the eight stages in the ring oscillator. The greater the drive strength, the higher the oscillation frequency. Let's look at demo 3. To set the drive strength, we need to provide a password of 9696 hex in bits 16 through 31. Therefore, I'll define a variable with the password in the most significant bytes and the drive strength for each of the four stages in the least significant bits. Here I set all three bits for each stage by entering 7, which will give us the highest stage drive strength. I could also use 3, 1, or 0. Then at the beginning of the program, I'll load in the ROSC register base address, load in the drive strength variable, and then store it in both Freak A and Freak B registers. Let's try it out. The blink frequency at high strength is 38.2 Hz, a 67% increase from the base low drive strength. For comparison, here's a table showing the effects of varying drive strengths. Remember, Although we can use many different methods to dial in a ring oscillator frequency, the clock is still unstable. For many applications, this minor variability is good enough, but for time-sensitive applications, we may need a more accurate clock, such as the crystal oscillator. Turning to section 2.16.1 of the RP2040 datasheet, we see that the RP2040 supports crystals from 1 to 15 MHz. The Raspberry Pi Pico features a 12 MHz crystal. I'll demonstrate how we set up the crystal oscillator in demo 4. To provide a glitchless transfer to the crystal oscillator, we'll start the crystal oscillator first, verify that it's running, and then transfer the system clock from the default ring oscillator to the crystal oscillator. In this demo, I've removed all the ring oscillator startup code, although I've kept the ring oscillator variables as a reference. I'll set up a variable for the base address of the crystal oscillator register as 4002400 hex. I'll also use the atomic register to set some of the bits, so I'll define the crystal oscillator atomic set base address as 4002600 hex. First, we need to set the crystal speed. As you can see from the crystal oscillator control register in section 2.16.7, we really don't have a choice. We just have to load the register with AA0 hex. At the beginning of the program, I'll load the crystal base register into register 0. Load register 1 with AA hex, shift it over 4 bits, and then store it in the control register. Then, per 2.16.3, we need to enter the wait time of about 1 millisecond before we can use the crystal oscillator. For a 12 MHz crystal, the wait time factor is about 47 decimal, which will store in the startup register with an offset of 0C hex. Now that we've selected the crystal, we need to enable the crystal oscillator atomically. What this means is that we'll use the atomic set register to make our lives easier 
by allowing us to set individual bits without having to do the whole read, exclusive or, and write dance. See my first bare metal adventure video for more information. I'll put a link in the description below. Load the atomic set base register into register 0 and then load in the required enable password of FAB000 hex into register 1, which I then store atomically into the crystal oscillator control register. Now that the crystal oscillator is started, we need to wait for it to become stable before we switch the RP2040 to the crystal oscillator. I'll reload the crystal oscillator base address into register 0, and then grab the crystal oscillator status at an offset of 4. Note that if bit 31 is set, the oscillator is running and stable, so I'll shift the status word right 31 bits, and then check if the result is 0. If it is, the clock's not yet stable, so I'll go back and check it again. Otherwise, I'll switch the RP2040 clock to the crystal oscillator. To do this, we need to access the clock registers as described in section 2.15.7 of the RP2040 datasheet. The RP2040 has several different clock generators for the processors and peripherals. These are listed in section 2.15.3.1. Each clock generator can switch among most of the clock sources with glitches and between a few clock sources without glitches. It's important to switch clock sources with no glitches. A glitch could cause the processor to hang. Section 2.15.3.2 details how to perform glitchless transfer. In our case, we're going to adjust the reference clock and the system clock. First, we will glitchlessly transfer the reference clock from the ring oscillator to the crystal oscillator, and then we'll glitchlessly transfer the system clock to the reference clock, which is now running on the crystal oscillator. I'll start with loading the clock base address of 4000-8000 hex into register 0. Next, I set the reference clock generator control register to get its source from the crystal oscillator by storing a 2 into that register at an offset of 30 hex. Then I'll change the source of the system clock generator from the system auxiliary clock, which was using the ring oscillator, to the reference clock, which we've just switched to the crystal oscillator by storing a 0 in that register at an offset of 3C hex. At this point, the processor should be running on the crystal oscillator. Let's try it out. It seems to blink about twice as fast as the default ring oscillator clock. That sounds about right, since the crystal oscillator frequency is exactly 12 MHz. Let's see if I can correlate the timing of the blinky LED to the clock frequency. I added up the clock cycles in my LED loop. I got the clock cycles per instruction from the ARM Cortex-M0 Plus datasheet. As you can see from my calculations, each LED loop should take 7.86 million clock cycles. At an LED loop period of 494 milliseconds, that gives us a clock frequency of 15.9 megahertz? That can't be right. He's intelligent, but not experienced. This pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. Just like Khan in Star Trek II, I'm suffering from two-dimensional thinking. This is my first time doing assembly language programming with the processor that has pipeline memory access. I now realize that you can't just count up the machine cycles and calculate the time. For instance, pipelining improves the throughput of this example by over 30%. However, it took me a while to figure this out, so I was skeptical that I was really clocking the processor at 12 MHz. So I decided to send the reference clock to GP out 0 so I could measure it with my scope. Let's return to demo 4. First, I loaded the code A hex to select the reference clock. Then I shifted it left 5 bits to line it with the aux SRC register and stored it in the clock GP out 0 control at an offset of 0. Next, I set bit 11 and stored it in the atomic set register for the clock GP out 0 control, which enables GP out 0. Because GP out 0 is a peripheral clock, 
it has to be released from reset just like the other GPIO outputs. I'll release IO Bank 0 from reset before I assign function 8 to GPIO 21, which will assign GP out 0 to that pin. Finally, I set bit 21 to enable the GPIO 21 output using the atomic set register of GPIO OE set at an offset of 24 hex from the SIO base. Let's check it out. The oscilloscope confirms that I'm using a 12 MHz clock for the processor. But that's pretty slow. After all, the Pico SDK has a 125 MHz clock by default. How do we get there? That's where phase locked loops come in. A PLL is a voltage controlled oscillator that runs at a much higher frequency than the base clock, but is synchronized to the base clock. Per section 2.18, the RP2040 has two phase lock loops, one for the USB and one for the system clock. The PLL frequency is derived by multiplying the base clock frequency by the feedback divider divided by the product of the post dividers 1 and 2. In section 2.18.2.1, we're given the parameters to generate a 125 MHz clock frequency from the 12 MHz crystal. In this case, the feedback divider is 125, post divider 1 is 6, and post divider 2 is 2. Let's add the system PLL to demo 5. Since the system PLL is a separate peripheral, it must be brought out of reset just like IO Bank 0. Use the Atomic Clear Register to set bit 12 of the Reset Atomic Clear Register, which will bring the system PLL out of reset. Then, just like the IO Bank 0 reset, I'll check the status of the reset. If bit 12 is still 0, then the system PLL is still in reset, so I'll go back and check again. If bit 12 is 1, then I'll proceed with configuring and enabling the PLL. Per section 2.18.3, the programming sequence for the PLL is as follows. Program the reference clock divider, which is a divide by 1 in the RP2040 case. We've already done that. Program the feedback divider. Turn on the main power and voltage controlled oscillator, or VCO. Wait for the VCO to lock, that is, to keep its output frequency stable. Set up the post dividers and turn them on. Finally, we need to switch the system clock from the reference clock to the PLL. Note that the PLL is the default for the aux clock, so all we need to do is to switch from the reference clock to the auxiliary clock. When we run demo 5, we see the LED blinking at 21.2 Hz, which is over 10.4 times faster than the RP2040 running on the 12 MHz clock. This shows that the clock is indeed running at 125 MHz, which is over 10.4 times the base frequency of 12 MHz and is proportional to the increase in clock frequency from 12 MHz to 125 MHz. The final clock source I'd like to demonstrate is the use of external clocks. There are two GPIO clock inputs, GPN0 and GPN1. They can be connected to GPIO20 and GPIO22 respectively. Since they utilize IO Bank 0, I'll release the GPIO and the GPN at the same time. I'll demonstrate that with demo 6. Since I already have GPIO20 tied to a switch, I'll use GPN1 along with the associated GPIO22. I'll connect GPIO22 to my frequency generator outputting a 3 volt square wave through a capacitor to eliminate any DC bias. The frequency generator can output any frequency from 0 to 10 MHz. After IO Bank 0 comes out of reset, I'll load the GP22 control register address 400140B4 into register 0. Then I'll invoke function number 8 to tie GPIO 22 to GPN1. See section 2.18.2.1.
2.19.2. Store the function number 8 into the GPIO22 control register. Now that GPIO22 is connected to the clock input GPN1, we need to switch the clock source from the default ring oscillator source to GPN1. First load the clock register's base address into register 0. Then load 41 hex into register 1. This selects the auxiliary source for the reference clock as GPN1 and then selects the auxiliary source as the source for the reference clock. Then I'll save that value to the reference clock control register at an offset of 30 hex. Next, I'll load 0 into register 1 and then save it to the system clock control register at an offset of 3C hex. This selects the reference clock as the clock source for the system clock. I'll start with the frequency generator at 5 MHz. When I slow the frequency generator down, the blinking also slows down. When I increase the clock frequency, the blinking speeds up. A variable clock on the fly. That's pretty cool. Thanks for joining me today. This time we explored the various clock options of the RP2040. We examined the ring oscillator, the crystal oscillator, the phase lock loop, and external clocks. I also showed how the RP2040 can output a clock for use in other circuits. Next time, I'll drive a little deeper into bare metal programming the RP2040, so stay tuned. If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!